ja. Wat blijft er nu? Esther people in this church to help me out here this morning. Because there's some words in here that I don't want to pronounce right. So when I come to them names, I will throw out some help for somebody to pronounce it for me. <laughs> so, so I think y'all know what the names are here, so we shall start. Scripture to read today is Jonah 1, 1 through 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah, Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Torres. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fee, he went aboard and sailed for Torres, Torres to, flee, to flee from the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, it is. <laughs> Father, we come before you today, Lord, as we read your word, speak to us through your spirit. We thank you for the love that you have for us. What a passionate pursuing love that you would pursue even your enemies to draw them close to you so that they could be adopted as your only children. We just thank you, Father, for... All the wonderful blessings that you've given us. We thank you that we can come and freely worship you without persecution. We pray for those that aren't here today, for those that are out fighting fires and other things, Lord. And we just thank you that you are in sovereign control of all things. And help us see that through your scripture and reveal it through your word and through your spirit. We pray this today in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So last week you got a short sermon. Not happening this week. <laughs> Just so you know, maybe it won't be too long, but we'll see. We've got to cover a lot of Scripture. And then we, I entitled this, Who is God? Part 3. Because I want to tie this together again, because so many times, especially in this age, in the church age today in this country, we just want to talk about God's love, but we don't talk about His sovereignty. We don't talk about the fact that He is judge. We don't talk about the fact that He's a jealous God. We just say, God is love, God is love. But see, God is completely love, which completely accents and does everything for His judgment and righteousness. He has to. So today you hear people say, oh, well, the loving God just couldn't send anybody to hell. He has to because of their rejection of His only Son dying for them. So that our place that we were going to call home, this is not home. We are foreigners in this land. But where we're going to call home for all eternity will be a perfect place. And if we don't want anybody to go to hell, then we need to tell them the gospel message. That's what we've been called out to do, to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. So as we're reading in John chapter 12, we've reached this end of this chapter, which is judgment time, basically. Do you believe or do you not believe? And if you do believe then Jesus calls you out to follow after Him. Even as He is going to die on the cross, you must die to this world and take upon His mission, His fact. The reason that He came, the reason the Messiah came to the earth. And here we get an example of Jonah, where he's called to the Lord, and what's he do? He heads in exactly the opposite direction, right? Now, I don't know about you, but I think about how many times have I done that? So if I'm not speaking to anybody here but myself, I'm speaking to myself. So when we left off in part two, we were talking about the sovereignty of God. We talked about Isaiah, the prophet, 
and how he foretold about Jesus because he saw Jesus' glory. And John quotes him in John chapter 12. Jesus quotes him in John chapter 12. And we went back and looked at the prophecies of Isaiah and we looked at one that he said about this guy named Cyrus who we know from history now is Cyrus the Great who did everything that, that Isaiah foretold because God told him what to say. Now see the problem is that sometimes... We think God just doesn't care about us. Or we think maybe He's not in control with the fires going on, the loss of life or property or anything. Maybe He doesn't care. Maybe He's not in control. Maybe He just picks up the pieces and then He runs with them. That's not the God of the Bible. That's why I want to stress this. The God of the Bible tells us of a sovereign God who is in control of every last thing. Who when he speaks, you ever been so close to somebody when they were talking to you, they kind of spit on you? Well, if you were close to God, that would be galaxies. Billions and billions of them that come out of the moisture of his breath. And yet he loves us and wants a relationship with us. Even when we say, um, I want this relationship as long as I can stay on the throne, not you. So we say all these buts that we have, that we talked about that a few weeks ago. When Jesus said, anything you got to say, my answer back is, but you will receive power. So you can live a changed life. You can be an example. You can understand Scripture. You can live a holy, sanctified life. And if you've heard me talk about it before, and I've seen it in my own life, where these sins that were in my life that, that had such a hold on me and everything, that when I did finally realize that and say, I'm tired of fighting these sins... And he said, I've been telling you to give them to me for years and years now. And then I do. I watch the Spirit sanctify me. And then I look at the same things before. I look at the lustful flesh that I had before. And, and now I look at it and say, huh, I don't care anything about that. It's as foreign to me as eating a car battery. I don't think about that. It's not desirable. I don't ever think about that. So He sanctifies me and makes me holy enough where I don't think about lying or cheating or anything else. Because that's what His will is, is to sanctify us through His Word. His Word is truth. The Word is flesh and dwelt among us. So sometimes we fail to see God's sovereignty. And then we put God into this little box and say that, well, He's a God that picks up pieces. But He's not. He is a God that has prepared you in your mother's womb, that has called you before man was even a thought or in existence. And He called you to follow after Jesus. That's where we've kind of left off in John chapter 12. So we looked at a major prophet, Isaiah. Big major prophet. Now we're going to look at a little tiny prophet. A minor prophet. So tiny he could get swallowed by a whale, right? That's not what major prophet and minor prophet means. Major prophet just has a lot written down and a minor prophet doesn't have much. You can go home and read Jonah from the beginning to the end in probably 20 minutes. That's all it's going to take. There's four chapters and they're not even long chapters. I know sometimes you look at the chapters when you read in your Bible and you're like, this one has 50 verses. <laughs> you know? Well, they're not that long in Jonah. And they're, they're divided pretty evenly in what happens. Chapter 1, Jonah flees from God. You think God didn't know that? Jonah fleed from God because Jonah made a choice to do that. But God had people on the ship waiting to find out who this God was. Wow. And he had this... Jonah's not a whale guy, by the way. He's a fish guy. <laughs> That's what the Scripture says. So when you read, understand the Scripture. We got into a big thing about unicorns, right, Polly? <laughs> That's an inside joke, but she's like, oh, you and your unicorns. So this weekend she even got me a little unicorn finger puppet so I can have one. Because unicorns are in the Bible. They're in the King James. But see, unicorn today, the word has changed meaning and it's a fable. Because see, Satan's done that to, so it would be a lie. So that when people read the Bible today and you say, uh, unicorns in your King James Version, they say... I told you the Bible is just a bunch of fairy tales. Well, see, unicorn is just a word. Exactly. And we call a unicorn today a, a mystical creature. But if you go back to 1828, the same Webster's Dictionary, it says a one-horned animal. 
And then it goes on to talk about Scripture also in a dictionary. Can you believe that? And then if we study more, yeah, yuna means one and corn means horn in, in English, but in the Bible it's just a wild animal. We do know when we read Scripture that it has at least a horn, maybe horns. Because David said, you saved me from the lion, and we understand that, but it also says you saved me from the horns of the unicorn. So guess what? David was saved from a unicorn by God. But it wasn't a little horsey with rainbow colors. Okay, <laughs> It was something dangerous that he compared to a lion. And you understand that. You don't want to be out there with a lion around. Did you see on the news? <laughs> a mountain lion went in this home somewhere around Rocky National Park or somewhere. I don't know where it was. <clears throat> and the thing about the whole story was they came home and saw a lion sitting on the couch chilling out. But he ate the house cat. <laughs> I guess he came and said, there's a new king in town, right? And then later came out of the house and was walking down the street after he had dinner. <laughs> That's in the news. True story. So a minor prophet just doesn't have much to write, but oh, do we have a lot to learn. First, that he was swallowed by a fish. Could be a whale, but the Bible just says fish. So Jonah is the fish guy, not the whale guy. And we're going to go to Jonah chapter 1. If you want to turn in your Bibles, you, we can turn there because I'm going to go through Jonah. It's not that long. I won't make it all the way through, but I'm going to start there. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come before me. But, remember that, Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. If you don't know anything about geography, that's the total opposite direction. Nineveh's over here, Tarshish is over here. Nineveh is over in the Euphrates River Valley, past Israel. Tarshish is on the top coast of Africa over by England. He's like, I'm going the opposite direction, like I can outrun God. And if you notice in your bulletins, all the different things about Jonah, and I put little sayings that go with each, so you can understand, man, God's grace, God's plan, God's sovereignty. There's more to this picture than what you and I see sitting in Bonner's Ferry. Paul tells us that there's a spiritual battle going on all around us. He headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from God. Now, we don't like looking at it that way, but anytime we say, but, are we not fleeing from God? Let's be honest. Is that not what we're doing? It's not the right time, I'm not equipped, whatever the things are, I just sim I'm just simply tired right now. But whatever the reason, you're fleeing from God. So I want you to think about who God is. I want you to think about how Jonah responded, and I want you to look at the circumstances as we read what happened, because there is a sovereign God who is in complete control of all things. And you and I don't understand them. We're not going to understand them all. And when tragedy befalls us, we're going to cry out to the Lord. And that's natural. And He wants us to cry out to Him because we're going to find our comfort and our strength in Him. This cross sits by my bed. It says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my Savior. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the strength of my salvation, and my stronghold, my high tower, my Savior. 2 Samuel 22, 2 and 3. And I have that by my bed so that I read it every day. So that I remember who God is and then I remember how much He loved me. Wow! If you look, notice from reading that, verse 1 says that the Word of the Lord came to Jonah. John says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That the Word was light to us so that we would come out of darkness and shine so that others may see the glory of God and worship Him. Verse 2 says go. Sounds like how the Great Commission starts off, doesn't it? The Great Commandment, not the Great Suggestion. Go! And proclaim the Gospel message, teaching others to obey everything I have commanded baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, so that they will make disciples, seed-making seed. 
Verse 3 says, but. Well, I'm glad. Like I said, there are plenty of verses where the but is that God so loved the world so much that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. But this is the kind of but that we so many times use. But, Lord, not today, not me, but I'm going to run in the opposite direction because I'm fleeing from you. My God, my Father, my Savior, my King. Why in the world would Jonah ever do such a crazy thing? But why do we do such crazy things? Let's read on. Pay attention again to the sovereignty of God. The actions of Jonah, who is God's child. Put your place in this, your name in this story. And then look at the response of pagans. The response of creation. The waves. The fish. Everything else. Everybody around it besides God's child is obeying and worshiping God. What does it take sometimes to get through this knot head of mine? But I'm so glad he continues to pursue me. Verse 4. <clears throat> as a response to God's child's misbehavior, right? Then the Lord sent a great wind in the sea. What happened? The sea rose up. The sea obeyed. And such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. See the setup here of the story? We have all these people believing all these pagan gods, and we have God saying, I'm going to reveal my glory to you. You've got to decide if you're going to follow me or not. Even my servant is not following me right here. But I have glorified my name and I will continue to glorify my name. Do you recognize that from John 12? When a voice audibly spoke out from heaven and Jesus said, this voice was not for my benefit, it was for yours. And they threw cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. Remember those scriptures where it says, Awake, O Christian, come out of that slumber. <laughs> you are alive, but you don't even know it because you're passing the time by sleeping, not paying any attention to what's going on around you. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God, your rescue, your Savior. Let's see if your God can be put up to the test. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Huh? John chapter 3 verse 16, we will not perish but have everlasting life. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots. God's even in control of this. To find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Coincidence, right Jacob? No. No coincidence. Do you know that John the Baptist's father was serving as the priest at that time because he was decided by lots? Hmm. God is in control of such a little thing as that. <clears throat> Verse 8. So they asked him, Tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? Because see, when people see your actions and your name is associated with Christ, Christian, I proclaim to be a Christian like Christ, they are looking at your actions. Good? Yes. Indifferent? No. Bad? No. But God's glory is still going to be shown through them. They said, what's going on? Tell me about your story. Okay? He answered, I am a Hebrew. I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm one of the followers of Christ, His chosen people. And I, what's that word there? Worship the Lord. We've talked about that before. It's about laying yourself out prostrate. prostrate. Get it right? No, you did it wrong. Prostrate. Yes. I always do that. I told you, I always. And Bob wasn't here to correct me. Look at that. But you corrected me. Thank you. <laughs> before God out of reverence, 
worshiping and adoring Him, kissing the ring finger, kissing His feet, anointing His feet with the oil. Oh, we just read about that in John chapter 12. Mary was lavishly pouring out oil that was worth a year's wage. And even the disciples said, what waste? And Jesus said, no, that's worship. <clears throat> I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them. And they asked, what, what have you done? Why would you not obey God, your God? What, what, what are you doing? The lots fell on you. We know this calamity is caused from you. And they hadn't seen anything yet. And then it says, they knew he was running away from the Lord. Now, how did they know that? Just because a lot fell in his direction? Because the sea hasn't calmed down yet or anything, right? We got a lot. That's it. If I buy a lottery ticket and I win something, are you going to say that the Lord is my God? I don't think so. You're going to say it's random chance or coincidence again. But they knew that he was running from the Lord because he had already told them so. Now, I don't know how he told them so. It doesn't tell me here. Maybe he told them in those questions. Maybe they sovereignly knew it. I don't know. Verse 11 goes on to say, The sea was getting rougher and rougher. But see, they already knew. Did they have faith that this God would calm the sea? I don't know. So they asked him, What should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that this is my fault, that this great storm has come upon you. Now they've got to sacrifice Jonah, to murder him. What are they going to do? What comes natural to man with his own wisdom? Because we can't think that God would do this. Well, let's look back at Scripture and see if He doesn't go into a foreign land and says, kill all the men, the women, and the children. But we don't want to think about God that way. There's something wrong with that God. Maybe He's not sovereign. Or maybe He's so sovereign that we don't need to make up an age of accountability or anything like that. That We just simply need to say... Those people that were there were souls God handpicked and put in them. If any one of those children should have been saved, they will be saved. It doesn't have to be an age or anything else that we come up with. We can simply say God is sovereign. So that when these tra tragedies and things come our way and we don't understand them, we can say, God, you are sovereign. I don't understand everything. I don't like everything but I'm going to worship you and you only. <clears throat> Instead, the men did their best to row back to land. <laughs> like they're going to row against this God. Hmm. But they could not. The sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord. Not their gods, the God. The God who has been the same throughout history, who will never change who is perfectly blended with judgment and perfectly blended with grace. The choice is up to you. It says clearly when He gave them the law, He said, choose this day blessings or cursings, life or death. The choice is yours. <clears throat> Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life because we're going to listen to you now. We, we, we're going to put you in your place. We don't understand it. If it means murder... We're going to throw this guy overboard because you've told us so. And we want to save our own skin, don't we? <clears throat> Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. I believe that's a God we see throughout Scripture. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. Not because of what they did. God would still carry out His plan regardless. But because God is in control of the waves and seas. Even the demons obey Him and shudder at the name of Jesus. At this the man greatly feared the Lord. And again, there's a word for worship. The beginning of wisdom is fearing the Lord for who He is. But then perfect love casts out all fear. Because I fear my dad in a loving manner because I know he's never going to do anything to harm me. 
and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and they made vows to Him. Now the sovereign, mighty, gracious, everything that you want to put attached to God's name, that Lord provided a huge fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now you know that this is a sign of Jesus Christ. But that's not where this sermon's going. You think Jonah at that time saw that fish as a saving grace from God? Or he said, man, I just went from bad to worse. Maybe, just maybe I could have held out in these waves and found a, a piece of wood or something to float on, but now I'm getting swallowed. There is no hope. Remember when Jesus hid himself in John chapter 12? The light for, hid themselves? Inside of that well, that well, oh, that fish's belly, maybe a well, I think it was pretty dark. I don't think there was much light at all there. But what does Jonah do? Chapter 2 tells us, From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. Now we get down on our knees. Now we say, when calamity has stricken us, is that right? That works? It's stricken us. Now we get down on our feet and say, you know, I should have listened to you in the first place. I knew who you were. I just thought I could flee from you for a little while. But God is still going to glorify His name. And He's going to do it through you, whether you're obedient or not. Because that's why you were created in the first place. To bring worship, glory, and honor to Him. He said, In my distress I called the Lord, and He answered me. Wow! From deep in the realm of the dead I call for help. Now I don't know about you, but depending on the fish, He could have dived down thousands of feet into the ocean. So not only was it dark inside the fish, but even if He could see out, if the fish saw out or something, said, Here, let me show you. He, all He saw was darkness and gloom surrounded Him. Death. No hope whatsoever. But he said, I cried out from the realm of the dead for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. Boy, that's pretty rough. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. To the earth beneath bared, bared me forever. But you, Lord my God, you, you're the one sovereign. You brought my life up from the pit. He's not out of there yet. But he sees hope. He sees the glory of Jesus like Isaiah did. He sees a God who is sovereign, but a God who is gracious and loving. A God who is just but a God that offers mercy. Mercy is exactly what I did not deserve. My deeds, my wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God. That's what I deserve. But He offers me gr mercy and grace. Grace is this extra that I get, that I can be called a child of God. Not only did I get what I didn't deserve, but I get the riches of the kingdom of heaven. Because I am a child of God. <clears throat> Verse 7, When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayers rose to you, even from the bottom of the sea, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say this, Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited. Ew. Jonah owned a dry land. Not just any dry land. Well, where are you supposed to go? What's the chances of that? And again, I don't know how far he got, but Tarshish is a long way from Nineveh. But he spit him up on the shores there where he needed to go. Chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Wow, he didn't squash him like a bug. He said, listen to me, put a little thumb on him, just a little bit to let him know he was God. And he said, now I'm going to come to you a second time. Go 
to that great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. <laughs> Part of our reasons that we worry about this is, God, I know you want me to go talk to this person down here, but number one, I got a problem with him. <laughs> you know, I don't want to get past that. And number two, I don't know what to say. Uh, proclaim the message I give you. If you haven't read Jonah, <laughs> the NIV is eight words. That's not much of a message. But that was God's message. So it's all the message we ever need. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord. He went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. It was a great pagan city. Don't forget this. They didn't deserve righteousness. Huh. But no one deserves it, do we? Hmm. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Here's a sermon. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. I know you all are thinking, man, I wish one time you'd give a sermon like that, right? Be honest. That was his sermon, though. That's what the, the Lord, his God, gave him. This sovereign God who commands the winds and the waves. And the timing, space and time, mean nothing to God. Nothing whatsoever. He holds them in the palms of his hands. Huh, verse 5, look, the Ninevites, the word John writes almost a hundred times in his gospel, so that you might believe, the Ninevites believe God. And here's what happened as a result. Uh, there's actions, not just head belief, and then we'll go run and do whatever we want to. A fast was proclaimed. And all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. That's what could have happened to the pagan lands that he told them to destroy. They could have turned. You and I have so many chances to turn. But see, one day we might not have a chance to turn. And that's what Jesus is saying in John chapter 12. And he's also saying, if you believe, you will follow after me. You will lay down your life just as a seed does to die to produce more seed, more disciples. Spreading the word of God, being my hands and feet, letting them know the love of the Father through the Son and through His children. <clears throat> when Jonah's warning reached, I'm going to add a word in here, even the king, so now we have the man in authority, the man that was God to these people, even the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, his throne, catch that, because that's where we sit so many times. Ours is just called an easy chair with a TV remote, right? And air conditioning and sweet iced tea, but not as sweet as it used to be because my wife cares about my health. <laughs> he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Who sits on your throne? This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. So he told all those under him, By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? Maybe this God of judgment of the Old Testament will show mercy and grace. And I already said that this Jonah was a sign of Jesus to come. Jesus even said it in Scripture Himself, that He would give no other sign. He gave plenty of signs, but as Jonah stayed in the belly of the fish. Got it right. Three days and three nights. <clears throat> Who knows? God may relent and with compassion turn from His fierce anger so that we will not perish, but instead have life. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, huh? what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, He could see their actions. He relented. He changed his mind and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Now, again, knowing the sovereignty of God, he knew all this. Doesn't mean that he changed his mind, but he changed his mind so that we could see it, so that we could see mercy and grace. He knew all of this. 
He knew that Jonah would run. He knew where the fish was and created him that big to swallow him up, to drop him right where he needed to be, to tell him again to go to these people, to give him just eight words. And he knew because he placed in those vessels the souls that he needed to place to turn so that he would heal them. What do you think about those that won't turn when what he did to give saving grace was give his only begotten son? Hebrews says what a terrible thing it is to fall into the hands of the living God. Because see, what he gave to save you wasn't a fish. It was his only son. Now we've gone through three chapters already. That wasn't that bad, was it? Chapter four, you're on your own. Or maybe it'll be another sermon, I'm not sure. I want to ask you some questions because I told you to look at Jonah's response. I told you to look at God's response. I told you to look at the pagan's response. So here's some questions for you. Do you believe in God? Do you believe that He created you? And if so, what did He create you for? Do you love God? Do you worship Him and give Him the adoration and glory that He deserves? Do you believe that God is in control of everything even when the bad things come? Do you believe this? Do you believe that God loves you so much that He would give His only Son to save you? Amen. And see, when you understand these things and you examine yourself, then you understand even more that, oh yeah, I can understand how He has to have a place called hell. And I have a responsibility to straighten my act up and follow in the footsteps of Christ so I can tell others so they don't have to face this judgment. All they need to do is turn, repent and turn. And He will save them through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We're going to take communion today because it tells us to remember what Christ has done for us. Revelation chapter 4 verse 4 says, and Revelations was written so we'd know the things that had to come. We don't have to figure all them out because Jesus already told us we don't need to know the times or seasons. That's not for you to do. But instead, you will receive power so that you can proclaim the Word of God. And he says here in Revelation, they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits. This is the 144,000 that are saved during the tribulation. But notice the word here is first fruits, which we are called by Scripture first fruits because we are called to bear a crop. And we have to do that by dying to ourselves so that we can produce a crop. They were offered as first fruits to, the God, to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless, not because of what they've done, but because of their faith, because they take on the righteousness of Jesus. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Sounds a lot like the Great Commission again. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of judgment has come. Worship God, the God who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. This God of Jonah this God of chapter 12, when His one and only Son saying, judgment time has come. You've got to decide. Do you really believe? Because it's time to put your faith where your mouth is and put it into action. James says this in James chapter 1, starting in verse 16. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change. He's the same yesterday today, and forever. He doesn't change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits. Told you it was written elsewhere. Of all He created. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Every should, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. I think we have them mixed up a lot of the time. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is pre prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you. Planted, get that? Same thing with seeds. Which can save you. Do not merely listen to the words and deceive yourself. Do what it says. Now, maybe you thought I was out of John chapter 12, but I'm not. <laughs> 
I want to review to you so you understand where we're at. Passover was coming. Mary extravagantly worships Jesus. Even the other disciples say, that's a waste. Jesus said, no, that's worship. She is worshiping. Judah shows his true belief. It's pointed out by John. He didn't know it at this time, but he comes back to say it, that he was a thief. Ah, Jesus calls the one who doesn't keep the sheep a thief and a liar. He's come to steal and destroy. Crowds are gathering. They came to see Jesus and this walking dead person named Lazarus. They want to check him out too. So the religious leaders plot to kill Jesus even more because people are believing in Jesus. Jesus enters Jerusalem as not only a prophet, but the Messiah. And the people recognize Him for that. And they throw down palm branches. He fulfills prophecy by riding in on a donkey. Not even just a donkey, but the donkey's colt. And they say, Hosanna, save us. We recognize you as the Messiah. The word continues to spread. It's going all over the place. But the religious people, the ones who should believe, show their true colors. Some Greeks come, so they've come from all over the world, even the philosophical, philosophical place of the world where wisdom reigns to see this foolishness of Jesus, the Messiah of the Jews, this teeny tiny nation that Rome has their thumb on, just like the whale, had, or the fish, I keep doing the whale, had his thumb on Jonah. And Jesus, they anxiously wait for him to say these words. And he says, I'm going to go die. And you've got to come and follow if you believe. What? That's the words? That's the words that I came across the known continent to hear? I gotta, you're going to die and i got to die also? The hour has come. Unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it will not produce a harvest. If you really want eternal life, if you really value your life, you'll give up your life and come and follow me. The task that laid before Jesus, because He did know everything, because He was God, was overwhelming, not just the pain and suffering He would go through, not just the betrayal by His own brothers, but because He'd be separated from God for the first time ever. God would turn His back on His only child to save you and I. So he cried out to God. And he said, I know what I've got to do because I've known this from all before and I know what I've got to do so that they can live. And a voice came from heaven that said, I have glorified my name and I will glorify my name. Some people said it was thunder. Some people said it was an angel. What do you believe? Jesus said, it's judgment time. This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Satan's power will be overthrown here. He has no dominion over you. There's no excuses. You will receive power. And you will proclaim my name. You will be my hands and feet. Judgment time is here, believe it or not. So Jesus even withdrew. He took the light out of the world so that they could see again. And some believed. Not all disbelieved, but some believed. But they wouldn't come into the light because they feared what men would say and they desired men's worship and praise more than God's. So he quotes Isaiah the prophet. He says, Who has the arm or the power of the Lord been revealed? And that's why we look back at these prophets from the Old Testament who saw Jesus' glory and foretold of the power of God that He is sovereignly in control of all things that He is the supreme judge and He's also a merciful Father to those who would choose to believe. So he, Jesus even says, I am God. I came from God. I spoke His words. If you don't believe me, that's okay because I did not come to cast judgment as John started off in his gospel. But, but there will be a day don't doubt that. We've seen God of the Old Testament. There will be a day when He passes judgment. And you better believe that if He gave His only Son to save you, that that judgment's going to be exactly the worst thing you could ever imagine. 
But the opposite is exactly the best thing you cannot even comprehend as a child of the Most High. So I got a little sermon illustration. Life preservers. Look at that. Because that's what Jesus is, right? He's our life preserver. It shows you that in the bulletin. And you're looking at them. The reason there's two there is because we fight a spiritual battle. Jesus is the Christ. Satan is the anti-Christ. He may look like whatever. He may present himself like whatever. But he's not. All the treasures in this world will not profit you at all if you lose your soul. Don't build up treasures here on earth where moths destroy and thieves steal, but build up treasures in heaven. So Jesus had said to the crowd, here's the life preserver put in front of you. I understand you have a choice to make. You can choose life or death, blessings or cursings. It's up for you to decide. But see, one of these is not going to save you. And it says, welcome aboard. It's a wall hanging. It will sink. If you grab a hold of it, you will drown. God has provided a great fish, <laughs> His only Son to save you. But you've got to decide if you're going to take hold of Him or not. <clears throat> Here's the thing that you've got to decide. There are those who will do nothing. Because they don't understand that they are dying. They think everything is fine. If there is a God, He'll save us all. Or there's no God, it doesn't matter. I'll just be worm food. Whatever they think, so it doesn't matter to them. Those, there are others that say, hey, this might come in handy someday. I want fire insurance. But I don't want a Lord. I'll just take a Savior and hold on to it when I need it. Others will say, I really, really need this. They see their need to it but then they still kind of casually hold on to it. And I don't know about you, but if I knew I were drowning, I would grab hold of that life preserver with everything that I had. You would not be able to pry it from my hands. In Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 12, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, we all are filled by the Holy Spirit if we are God's children. He was led, he left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. This is Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 12. Where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered. He has three answers here. You may want to go back and look at them earlier. It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. Remember that. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all of their authority and splendor. and Because it, it has been given to me, even by God, because Satan can't do anything without God allowing him to do it. And Jesus said in John chapter 12, when I go to the cross, Satan's dominion and authority will have no hold on you. Death will have no sting. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want. The choice is yours. If you worship me, it will be yours. Jesus answered, second time, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. The devil then led him up to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you carefully. And if you haven't noticed, Satan is quoting Scripture. Because that's fine if you want to read this Bible and tuck it away and not let it pierce this heart. That doesn't bother Satan a bit. Because you're still choosing this day whom you will serve. And Jesus tells us clearly that we can't have two masters. Verse 11, they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. But Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Jonah did. Jonah still brought glory to God even when he was fleeing from God. You have the choice. Jacob, would you go out there please? Hold that life preserver. 
That's the real life preserver. It's a little smaller than this one really doesn't look that good or anything. Okay. It's a representation of Jesus Christ offering salvation to you. I just wanted him to do this so it would have a little more meaning. This is my only son. And I would not give him for you. Maybe I could say one day that I would. But there's no way that I would give my only son. And that's how much God loves you. And that's how much you're called to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. The choice is yours. Jacob's going to sing a song and then we're going to do communion. There's no right or wrong way to do communion. You can sing it with your life preserver on. <laughs> I'm not going to have anybody even service communion this time, but I'll explain it beforehand. And the choice is yours. And I'll give you some instructions because we do have instructions. And the instructions basically tell us to this church in Corinth that we're studying about, don't come and say that you're remembering what Jesus Christ did for you and not mean it. So get things right with the Lord before you come and take communion. If you don't want to take communion, don't. But we're going to do that because we want to remember exactly what God did for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. to be set apart I don't need to recognize the man in the mirror and I don't want to trade your plan for something familiar I can't waste a day I can't stay the same I want to be 